From the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom, this is Glenn Fulcher with another issue of Language Testing Bites. In issue 29.3 of the journal, we publish a paper on classroom-based assessment by Catherine Hill and Tim McNamara. The research described in the paper is based on Catherine Hill's PhD research. And so we invited Catherine to join us for issue 10 of the podcast to talk about this important area of research. Catherine is currently lecturer in clinical communication and learning development in the medical education unit at the Melbourne Medical School. Welcome to Language Testing Bites to talk about classroom-based assessment and your article in issue 29.3 of the journal. Well, thank you for inviting me. Classroom-based assessment hasn't received a great deal of attention in the language testing literature until relatively recently. And in fact, most of the work appears to have been done in general education and science education in particular. And most articles, including yours, uh, refer back to a paper by Black and William published in 1998 entitled Inside the Black Box. And perhaps we could start off uh, by asking you to tell us why this paper is now viewed as so important and what trends in research and language assessment it kick-started. Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, basically what they said in that article um, was that government policy and initiatives um, up until that point had been really focused on inputs and outputs in the classroom um, without really looking at what teachers were actually doing to try and achieve those outcomes. Um, So what they argued for uh, more attention to to that, and in particular they argued for uh, a greater focus and use of formative assessment, Um, And in another paper, which they drew on in the article um, Inside the Black Box, they uh, conducted an extensive literature review, like a meta-review. And what that demonstrated um, is that formative assessment could really improve learning outcomes. And so they were arguing that that's what policy and initiatives and research really needed to start focusing on more. Um, So in terms of the trends, um, there has since that time been a much greater emphasis on looking at classroom-based assessment and how teachers actually do assessment, in particular formative assessment. So there's been all sorts of things like people have been looking, um, for instance, at the relationship between formative and summative assessment, um, looking at criteria that teachers actually use, which are not necessarily not necessarily consistent with the official uh, criteria, um, and also looking at things like um, the influence of external assessment and reporting regimes on um, on what teachers do in the classroom in terms of assessment. In your explanation, there you refer to the development of formative assessment practices in addition to summative forms of assessment. Can you briefly explain each of these and comment on their role in the in, in classroom based assessment? Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, summative assessment is what we traditionally think of as assessment, you know, in the form of tests, for example. And their main purpose is um, really to report on student progress, say, to um, parents or to an outside authority, which has an accountability function, or to certify um, learners that as having accomplished satisfactorily um, finished a course of study or a unit of study or something like that. Um, Whereas formative assessment... um, it, it may take the form of tests, but it's often um, it's mu- it's much more it's much broader than that, much more varied than that, and it's characterised as assessment for learning, um, whereas summative assessments characterise as assessment of learning. So what they mean by that is that, or what is meant by that is that information from assessment, however that's gained, um, is then used either to modify um, the teaching to reteach something that hasn't been um, sufficiently understood, for example, and or to provide feedback to learners about how they can improve from what the assessment has shown um, in order to come closer to the standard that's desired. Um, And the other thing about formative assessment is, um, whilst it's often still conducted by the teacher, in contrast to summative assessment, um, there's usually, uh, or there's, there's more 
um, opportunity for learners to be involved in that process as well, um, either in self or peer assessment, um, but also even in negotiating the sort of criteria um, or the sort of the tasks that they will be doing to demonstrate their learning. So what, what that's all based on is that the idea that all students can improve and um, it's really important that they're actively involved in their own learning. Thanks. Uh, perhaps we can now turn to your paper and talk more directly about that. And in your approach, you have three parameters, um, evidence, interpretation and use. Um, taking each one in turn, can you tell us what each parameter is and what significance it has for describing and studying uh, classroom-based assessment? Well, um, what I found when I started looking at the literature is that um, evidence and interpretation and use of the three sort of criterial parameters or dimensions of assessment. So uh, assessment involves collection of evidence, interpretation of that evidence and use of it. But what I found is that how um, in the literature, how each dimension is understood is there's a lot of diversity there. So, for example, when we look at evidence, if you look at, well, you look at what's assessed, but also if you look at how uh, evidence is collected, some researchers see it as something that's planned, whereas others say it could be planned or incidental, um, or it might be um, something that's overt and highly visible, the learners know they're being assessed. Um, or it could just be embedded in everyday teaching. So that goes to sort of how it's collected. And then uh, another important factor that came out in the literature is, is that exactly who is being assessed, who's the target of assessment. And Torrance and Pryor, for example, um, concluded that it's in classroom-based assessment, it's more often assessment happening at the group level rather than individual students. So it's important to be looking at that as well. Um, and finally, uh, there's a question that I mentioned before about who's involved in the assessment. Is it just the teachers or are students actually involved in collecting evidence as well? Uh, and then the next thing, the next dimension or parameter is interpretation. And there's two things here is, is uh, there's differences in views about what level of attention um, the assessor teacher or learner needs, or let's say teacher. Um, for example, in Tim McNamara's definition, 2001, he, he says that it needs to be sustained attention, whereas other researchers would say that may actually be fleeting and, and sort of on the run. Um, and then, again, with to do with uh, interpretation, in terms of applying criteria to in, interpret the evidence, these criteria might be explicit um, or they might actually be unconscious um, in terms of what criteria are being applied to interpret what, what performance or whatever it is that's being assessed. And finally, in terms of the use, there's quite a range of purposes um, in the literature for um, assessment. So as we've mentioned before, it could be re reporting or certification. Um, it could be to use to plan or modify teaching as in the sort of more formative purposes. Um, but other researchers have talked about the management role of assessment. Um, and then there's the who is using the information. So it might be the information might be for the benefit of the teacher or an outside agency, or it might be for the learner. As I understand it, the study you describe in the paper is unusual in that you developed an empirical approach that led to the development of a framework for describing classroom-based assessment. Now, of course, our readers can download the study for themselves, and we hope they will, but perhaps here you can briefly summarise the study and its main outcomes for us. OK. Well, at the outset, I need to say that what's presented in the article is actually um, part of a larger study, which is actually my PhD dissertation. So I might need to sort of distinguish as I go along here. But basically what that was was a detailed ethnographic study of two Australian classrooms, school classrooms. And um, the students um, were aged 13 to uh, about 11 to 13, and they were studying Indonesian as a foreign language, which is quite tom commonly taught in Australia. It might sound odd to people overseas. But uh, so what I did is I looked at two successive levels of schooling, um, year six, which is the last year of primary school in um, Victoria, where I live, and then year seven, which is the first year of high school. Um, and I did this because uh, one of the things that I was interested in, in the in the 
larger study was the issue of um, continuity and transition. So I looked at those consecutive year levels. Um, so it was an ethnographic study. So I used participant, um, participant observation uh, and field notes. And I also collected um, audio recordings. So there was a, about 80 hours all up of audio recordings. And these were of classroom interactions. Um, so between students or groups of students and between the teacher and the class or students, um, individual students, and also interviews with um, teachers and students, uh, focus groups of students. And then I also did uh, a document anal analysis. So I looked at things like um, progress reports, the sorts of things that are sent to parents, worksheets and those sorts of things. So in terms of uh, one of the things, first of all, I need to say is that um, something that came up very early in the piece was how to capture or how to even uh, record or think about the more intuitive forms of assessment that are taking place um, in the classroom. And this was a particular issue in the sixth classroom because the, the teacher there didn't really do – all the assessment was embedded and um, it was very hard to sort of see when assessment was happening. And I talked to the teacher about this and – she sort of said, well, it's, it's all like you've, it's like you've got antennae sticking out of your ears and it all comes in and you're constantly processing it. So I sort of then thought, well, how am I going to record this? And so what I did was came up with the idea of uh, the assessment opportunity. And the way I described this is, is I looked at the affordances or the evidence that was available in the classroom um, that might be used for assessment in the recognition of the possibility that um, incidental assessment or intuitive forms of assessment are constantly taking place. So uh, a simple example is an activity where the, the teacher asks students to read aloud in turn um, and although it might not be a planned assessment opportunity, it affords the teacher an opportunity to uh, either consciously or unconsciously assess that individual's reading and pronunciation skills. Um, what that also allowed me to do was to sort of think about the classroom interactions at a, a, in general and think, well, what sort of, what quality of evidence is generated by the sorts of activities that the teacher is doing in that classroom? Um, the outcome was uh, of the study was a framework for analysing classroom-based assessment and this framework was based on um, a grounded analysis of the data, um, but it was also informed by existing research. And um, and the framework was uh, is in four parts, organised about around four main questions. And that is, first of all, what do teachers do? Uh, and then secondly, what do they look for? And then thirdly, uh, what theories or standards they use um, when they think about assessment. And finally, looking at what the learner understanding of assessment was. And then, uh, then of course, in the larger study, that framework was actually then used to analyse the data from the respective classrooms in order to um, compare the classrooms and, and draw more general conclusions about the um, meaning of assessment practices in those contexts. And uh, in, the, in the paper, you discovered that uh, there were four key processes uh, in classroom-based assessment, uh, that there was planning, uh, framing, conducting and using assessments. Um, in, in studies of classroom-based assessment to date, including those of Black and William uh, and the Assessment Reform Group, the notion of feedback to learners has taken a centre stage. So can you say what role feedback plays in your framework? Sure. Well, um, I suppose in the, those four processes, planning, framing, conducting and using, um, they're all part of the first part of the framework, which is what teachers do. So what teachers do is they plan assessment, frame assessment, conduct and use. Um, so in terms of using feedback, that relates um, to, uh, I talk about the type of feedback um, that is provided to learners. Um, so I distinguish a number of different types. And so the first type, and this is this is sort of documented in the literature as well, but the first type um, I call person-referenced. 
And that sort of feedback is really focused on the ego, on, on a fixed trait of the uh, student, if you like. It, so, for example, it's like, you're very smart, that was very good. Um, but it doesn't really tell them anything about the performance. Um, and there is uh, research to suggest that that actually has a negative impact on student motivation. It makes them more likely to compare uh, to be motivated by doing better than other people than in, um, rather than improving their own learning. So that was the first type per person referenced. And the other type of feedback I've characterised as task referenced. And um, in this type of feedback, there's much greater focus on, on the performance or, or on, um, on what the learner has done. And Again, this can be broken down into a num number of uh, different categories. So I've called them confirmatory, which is just like, yes, that was right, or tick um, explanatory, which is where they might, uh, the teacher might actually tell the student what they did well. Um, and then corrective goes a bit further and actually tells the student that the difference between what they did and what was expected in terms of what the level they're supposed to get to and, and basically how they might get to that level. So, uh, And the corrective feedback itself um, varies in terms of degrees of explicitness. And um, I considered this by using Frege's and Lantoff's uh, regulatory scale, but I won't go into that right now. Um, feedback actually comes up in other parts of the framework. It, under the sec in the second part, which is what do teachers look for, I looked at the content of feedback um, to look for criteria, for example. And in the last part, the, the fourth part, it looks at learner understandings of feedback. So feedback um, comes up quite a bit in the framework. Are there any other components of your framework that are novel and from which you think teachers can directly benefit when thinking about their own assessment practices? As I mentioned before, the framework does um, build on earlier models, but I think it extends them in a number of ways and it addresses a number of gaps or, how could I say, different frameworks have looked at different things. I guess this is sort of a, a comprehensive framework. And the sorts of things that might not necessarily be in other frameworks are things like looking at the values and beliefs informing observed assessment practices and um, and a specific focus on learners and their understanding of assessment. The other aspect of the paper that might be novel is that uh, the definition of classroom-based assessment that was adopted, which as I, I didn't really explain before, but um, what I did was adopted the broadest possible definition of a classroom-based assessment, which took in all the diversity that was represented in the literature. And this was because I wanted to include the most diverse range of data possible, given that was the methodographic approach that I used. Um, and also uh, the notion of the assessment opportunity, which, uh, as I tried to explain before, uh, tries to uh, looks at all the affordances offered in the classroom and therefore all the sorts of things that might provide evidence for the more intuitive forms of assessment. Uh, and finally, um, I guess, as you said at the beginning, most of the work to date has been done in general education and science education. And there's also mo more recently been quite um, a bit of work done on English as an additional language. But I, I'm not aware of any other work that's done uh, this sort of uh, level of detailed study in the context of school-based foreign language. So I guess that's sort of quite novel as well. And uh, the second part of your question was to think about how teachers might benefit from this article. I need to emphasise that the aim of the empirical study was to understand rather than evaluate classroom-based assessment practices. So I really wasn't there to judge the teachers. Um, and the focus of the article itself was presenting the framework rather than describing the outcomes of the main study, which has a lot more to say to classroom teachers, I think. However, um, the framework as presented in the article um, may certainly be useful for teachers to help them think about their own assessment practices and, um, and there's certainly plenty of literature out there, uh, plenty of evidence on how different assessment practices impact on learning. And the sort of things I'm thinking about here are the types of feedback they provide um, and also to, to be more reflective about um, how their values and beliefs may uh, impact on their assessment practices and uh, also a great focus on the learner role 
um, in the assessment process. Um, and in the main study, there was some quite amusing and interesting data on, on students' misunderstandings of uh, what was important in the classroom. Um, so, yeah, so I think uh, there is something for teachers. I there. think that research in classroom-based language assessment is set to grow in the coming years. And the publication of your framework as a resource in framing that research is very timely. Uh, we'd like to thank you for choosing language testing in which to publish your research and for joining us on Language Testing Bites to help elucidate the issues for our readers. I hope that's what it's done. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you for listening to this issue of Language Testing Bites. Language Testing Bites is a production of the journal Language Testing from Sage Publications. You can subscribe to Language Testing Bites through iTunes, or you can download future issues from ltj.sagepub.com or from languagetesting.info. So, until next time, we hope you enjoy the current issue of language testing.